Good morning, Oakwood. And welcome to the last part of this series we've been in over the last three weeks called Anxious for Nothing. And I hope that uh, maybe if you have not memorized it, maybe you're so familiar with it, you can almost say it from memory. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, as we've been uh, talking about that. We've really been addressing an issue that is, uh, it's, it's a hot culture thing, it's in our culture, it's, it's, in, it's in people's lives, it's even in people's lives in the church, and that's that, that, uh, that fear, that worry, that stress, that anxiety uh, that we can have as we look at our circumstances in life and as we try to manage uh, what's coming at us in life. Right at the end of the first service, I had uh, somebody come up and, and share with me, somebody we've been praying for in the past, uh, that he's had cancer before, and he says his cancer is back. And I hate to hear that. It's, it's bad news. Nobody wants that news. But I looked him in the eye, and I said, are you anxious? Are, are you? And he said, this series has like been perfect for me because you know, I, I, I really believe God's got this. And I believe that every time I start feeling anxious, I'm just going to pray, and I'm going to release it to God, and God's going to get me through uh, this time, whatever it holds, whatever's in my future, because they really don't know right now. And so uh, it's just a reminder that no matter what comes your way in life, uh, what did we learn the first week? Do you remember that God is near? It says there in Philippians 4, that, that it doesn't matter. It doesn't say, oh, he's not near when you do this or when you have this or when you committed this sin in your life or if you've been running away from God, it doesn't say that he's not near then. It just says, hey, believer, God is near, and especially in your time of need. God is near to you. If you remember that, uh, we remember when, when Satan, through the struggles of life, screams at us through the pain. There's that gentle whisper of God, and it's because he's close. Satan's yelling because he's far away and because he really doesn't care. But God is close, and he speaks to us in the whisper. The second week, we, 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 we decided we're going to redefine anxiety in our lives. And, and we, we learned then that anxiety, is, what is it? It's just a signal, right? Anxiety is a signal alerting us that it's time to pray. And so when we feel worried and when we feel anxious and when we feel like life's got us down, all this stuff's going on, we're actually, we're just going to pray. It's just a signal reminding us, hey, it's time to give this over to God. And we, we learn that from that passage where it talks about with prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then we got to last week, and last week we talked about the, the posture of praise that we can get so caught up and just looking around us, we forget to quit looking up. And we don't, we just get caught up and we only see things in this world when you can only see things that are horizontal and we have no vertical focus to our lives. And the, and the fact is, is that the Bible says if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, you're a citizen of heaven. We don't even have citizenship in this world anymore. So why are we so caught up in the here and now and not what is to be down the road? And again, it's our, it's our focus. We've got to focus our hearts, affection, our minds, attention on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, guys. He's the one that's going to get us through. And then today, uh, we're going to be back in that passage. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn there to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be back there. And today, we're going to be talking about decisions. Decisions. That is something that can cause a lot of stress and anxiety. We, we talked about it and touched upon it a few weeks ago. That the average adult makes 35,000 decisions a day. If you wanted to go by time quotient, that means this morning you have probably made somewhere between three and 5,000 decisions already just since you got up, depending on what time you got up this morning. You had to make a decision if you're going to sit in the pew, right? Where are you going to sit? What are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? And take this medicine? And, you know, where am I going to do this? And, you know, all of these decisions, some of them are very little, and some of them you don't even think about them. I mean, you, you, you didn't think probably when you sat down, like, will this pew hold me? No, no one thought that this morning, right? You're just like, man, if I sit here, will it collapse? Will I hurt myself? No, no one thought of that, but you made that decision to sit, right? And so some of those decisions, they're just like, you know, easy. But some decisions, they can really weigh you down. They can really make you struggle. They can really make you worried. You know, got to con consider all the, the parts of that decision. Like, you know, what, 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 what if it's a decision with a job? You know, do I want to take this job or do I want to take this job? You know, this job requires more travel. I'm going to be away from my family more and it's more money, but is it worth the money to be away from my family all the time? And so I don't know, do I stay in this position or do I go here? Or maybe it's a job within the same company. Well, if I'm here and I, I'm in this position, but if I go over here, I can make this, this move and I can move up and pay, but there's a lot more responsibility and, and I'm not sure I can work with these people as much as I, I like the people I work with now. And is it worth it? To, you know, and all of these factors come into play. For some people, it's about the future, right? 
And we, we've talked about that. Maybe it's, maybe it's a future relationship. It's like, I don't know if I should continue pursuing this person in a relationship or if I should cut it off. If, if I should continue uh, pursuing this person that we might be married someday or, or, or if this is, a, this is a time where I just need to quit pursuing that. And I just, I just don't know if this is right. And what if I, what if I end up, you know, and I never find the one. And what, but what if I marry this person and it's not the right person. And, you know, what am I going to do? We, we talked about uh, for, for uh, kids, because I have a senior in my house, about the future with college plans, you know? How do I know which one to go to? And if I go there, do I take out a student loan? Because I don't really want to go in debt, and I don't have these payments, you know, that I'm having to pay all the time, and, and these payments just hanging over my head for years. But, you know, at the same time, if I go here, I get a, do I get a better education here? So it's worth the money, and, and do I pay for that? And how many scholarships, and what am I going to go, and, and what, what classes am I going to take, and what degree? And then, you know, I got that decision. I, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? What do you want to do for the next 50 years? Where do you want to work? Well, I don't know. Well, you need to know that, you know. And it's, you, you see all of these decisions come into play, and it gets to this point where it's like, okay. Some of you right now, you're like, man, don't quit talking. I'm stressed out now. I, I've heard all that stuff, and some of you are like, I'm living that right now. I don't know, you know, what treatment to take or what's, the, you know, what's going to happen financially tomorrow and, and how this is going to work out for us, and you just don't know. And sometimes it's the not knowing that's the worst part, making a decision. And yet through it all, the Apostle Paul says to us in verse 6 of our passage, and he doesn't really have conditions around it, he just says, don't be anxious about anything. What about decisions? What about making these decisions, these these choices that I have to make? You know, sometimes I think we're really at a disadvantage here because we have too many choices. Anybody feel like they got too many choices? That's what I hate today. Too many choices. There is actually a condition called decision fatigue. Okay, decision fatigue. This is actually a diagnosable thing. It's actually a real thing now. And it's because we have to make so many decisions. I've noticed it in my own life that sometimes when I get home and my wife's like, hey, babe, do you want to do this or this? Or do you want to, you know, have this or this this week? Or do we want to go here or there? And all this stuff. I've made so much, so many decisions for the church. I've had so many people come in and, Eric, should we do this or that? And should we purchase this or that and do this? And, and then I made so many, I'm like, done. I'm like, no more decisions for us. I just want to go home and sit and watch the Chiefs, you know, on ESPN. And that's what I want to do. And, and it's, you know, it, it gets to that point, you know, where it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to check out. Why? Because I'm, I'm tired of decisions. I'm, I have decision fatigue. And sometimes I think it's too many choices. And really, if you think about it, we start this at a young age. I mean, we, we've got to own this. You know, sometimes our kids are like two or three years old. And what we'll do is we'll lay out outfits for them. But instead of just laying them out one and saying, this is your outfit, put it on, we give them choices, right? We lay out three outfits. Hey, which one do you want to wear? I don't want to wear any of them. I want to wear the purple socks with the, with the blue this. And, you know, you know what your kid would look like coming to church if you let them, you know, just pick out themselves. And so you're trying to guide them in those decisions, right? Yeah, you're trying to guide them. You can lay it out, but maybe that's too many choices. Maybe you just need to lay out the outfit and say, this is what you're wearing. You know, Amy and I have learned this with places to eat. It's hard to get three human little girls on the same page, you know. And so sometimes it's better if we just announce, we're going here. We're going here to eat, you know, we're, we're, we're Thursday night, we're going to do this. We're going to, you know, play games at home and, and stay home Thursday night, whatever it is. And it's just better to just kind of announce it and not to give them so many choices. Because it just seems like with the more choices you have, the more we get paralysis of analysis. And it really is a thing. And, and we get weary. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 would say, this to us rejoice in the lord always i will say it again rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all because the lord is near do not be anxious about anything but in every situation through prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to god and the peace of god which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Last week, we added two more verses to to this, the next two. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Dwell on those things. Whether you, whatever you have learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. 
And then again, Paul says, and the God of peace will be with you. And that's what we want. And be honest, being honest, that's what we need. I want to show you a contrast about decisions here uh, that we see in Scripture. And it's a good principle. And it's going to lead us into, into three things I want to share with you this morning. And uh, last week we were in Acts chapter 16. And you remember uh, the story of, of Paul and, and Silas. And they're thrown into prison uh, because they cast a demon out of a girl. Um, her owners were making money off of her fortune telling, and they were really mad, so they made up some charges, and they beat them with rods, threw them into prison. Um, ama- amazing story, and, and, and you know what happens through that situation, we find out, what, people get saved, right? Philippian jailers saved in the middle of the night. They're singing songs of praise. The whole, the whole prison is listening to them. Find out they get set free because of the, you know, looking on the Lord. He sets them free in the middle of the night. People get baptized in the middle of the night. It's just a crazy story. And then at the end of it, the people that put them behind bars actually come apologize to them. I mean, isn't God good? I mean, it's dire circumstance, it seems like. They're in prison. Who knows what's going to happen to them? And then the people that put you in there end up apologizing. But God, he just works that way sometimes. Well, now we're going back just a chapter before that. And if you look at chapter 15 um, in, in your Bible, it, it, it may have this subheading. Mine says, the Jerusalem Council. And, and what's happened here is that there were some people uh, that were uh, spreading the word of God that had a Jewish background, and they were kind of really passionate about the law and the law of Moses and things that they had to do in the Old Testament. You know, Some of those Old Testament things, they're, they're good for us today. And, and, and uh, Jesus had come into the world, and we understood uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ that that's what you were saved by. You were saved by grace through faith, it says in the book of Ephesians, and it's not by works. And so they had brought in some works, and they, they kind of added that to the formula for the Gentiles. Because, you know, they, they weren't Jews, they didn't understand the law, they didn't understand the background. And so we get to chapter 15, and this is what it says. It says, but some men came down from Judea, and they were teaching the brothers, in other words, the converts uh, uh, into Jesus Christ, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so we had Jesus, and in, in in, in saved by grace through faith, and now we're going to add something to it. We're going to add circumcision because it talks about that in the Old Testament. That was part of the, the custom of Moses, the law of Moses, is that if you were going to come um, and, and be, be saved, if you were going to identify yourself with the holy God of the universe, then, then you would, you would be, uh, you would be uh, circumcised. Now, you know, what's amazing about this is we have a hard enough time sometimes getting guys to be uh, baptized, Right? To get them to take him to the watery grave of baptism to humble themselves in such a way. Can you imagine if it's like, hey, yeah, uh, Jesus, before he left this world, go and make disciples of all nations, circumcising them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? It'd be like, no. A bunch of guys would be like, no, no. It's like, Jesus didn't say that, though. He, he didn't. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you can see they're, they're struggling here because they're trying to add, they're trying to put this yoke of the law on top of people. You, you read down a few verses, you get down to verse 5, it says, but some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, those were the ultimate law keepers, you know, the, the, the guys, they, it says they rose up and they said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Then they get down and they're still conferring the, the, the apostles, the elders of the church in Jerusalem, all the church leaders get together. They get down to verse 11 and they had concluded by that time, it says, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus just as they will. In other words, that Jews now were saved by the grace and the love and the favor of Jesus Christ, not by keeping the law. And what they were saying there is, hey, we're going to be saved by the grace of Jesus just like the Gentiles are. And so they were drawing this conclusion that that maybe they don't need to keep all the law of Moses. You get down to verse 19 and it says this. Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. We shouldn't trouble them with these extra laws and these extra rules. But should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things that have been strangled and, and from blood. And from the ancient generations Moses has had in every city who proclaims to you. So, you know, there's some good rules there. There's some good things that show the changed heart toward Jesus Christ, that, that show the changed life. But they're not these dictatorial rules that you have to do these things to be saved. Where it's Jesus and his word and what he's promised us plus whatever. In this case, it was, it was circumcision and all of the law of Moses. They did never keep all the law of Moses. That's why Jesus came in the first place. So anyway, you get to verse 22 of chapter 15. It, 
pay attention to what happens here. So they've been meeting together as a council, right? They've been talking and trying to make a decision here about how they're going to move forward. You get to verse 22, and this is what it says. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And, 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 and it talks in there about who they're going to send with the brothers and what they're going to say. You get down to verse 25, and it says, And it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get down to verse 28, then it says, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And it goes through the requirements I, I read just a minute ago. And so it's interesting, as they make this decision, they said three times in 22, 25, and 28 that it seemed good. When they were trying to make a decision, they did what seemed good to us. Now, there's a scripture that, that, that can contrast this a little bit, and it's found in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. It's on the screen. This is what that verse says. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Wait a second here. We have the whole council of the church in Jerusalem really making decisions that are going to affect the gospel, the, the spreading of the gospel to missionaries all in that region, that three times in Acts 15, it says that it seemed right to them, it seemed right to them, it seemed right to them. And yet we read here in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man. But here's the difference, is in the book, in the Acts chapter 15, it was a plurality of godly people. It was a plurality of believers making those decisions. They were leaning into and onto one another to make those choices about the advancement of the gospel. And I believe what Proverbs 14, uh, 12 is saying to us is there's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it's the way to death. Let me give an example of this. There's a way that can seem right to us when we're just, we're not reading the scripture, we're not praying to God, we're not really seeking God, we're not seeking the counsel of mature believers that God has put in our lives and put around us. And so we can almost make any way seem right. You know, it's like, well, you know, my wife and I haven't been getting along for years and I want to be happy and God wants me to be happy. So it seems right that I should divorce my wife so I can be happy and she'll be happier. And, and so you can talk yourself into that, can't you? You know, it's just a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's the way of death to my children, to my wife, and to the next generation of my family. But for a moment at least, I mean, I'm a good person, it seemed right. But in the end, it led to nothing good. There can be decisions that we make in life financially. That says, you know, it seemed right to invest my resources here. Now, I didn't read any prospectus, and I didn't talk to anybody, and I didn't pray about it. I didn't seek the counsel of the Word of God, but it seemed right to buy a second home. It seemed right. But in a way, it led to financial ruin and this yoke and this burden of I can't, I can't ever give to the Lord like the Bible commands me to. I can never sow seeds into the, the ministry of God's church because I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. But it seemed right. But the difference there in Acts 15 is that it seems right to us. That they were actually sharing these issues together, praying through them together, reading and studying the word of scripture together to come to a decision. And I'm just wondering if we would have a little less anxiety about the decisions that we make if we would have that be the pattern for decision making in our life. That we would do it as Acts 15. That we wouldn't end up, end up like Proverbs 14. There's three things about this I want to share with you this morning. To combat the anxiety involved in decision making. And can we all just agree that at some point or another, yeah, we have easy decisions, quick decisions, but then sometimes these are major whoppers and we're struggling with it. We're having anxiety, stress about what are we going to do. Well, how do we combat that? The first thing is this. We ask God for wisdom. We ask God for wisdom. You seek the wisdom of God. Look what it says in James chapter 1, verse 5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask god who gives generously to all without reproach what that means is god's not going to make fun of you for asking for wisdom he's not going to be like i can't believe you already don't know that 
I mean, come on. And he's not going to belittle you for asking for help, for asking for wisdom of what your next step's going to be or, or what your next choice is going to be. And it says that he who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. The amazing thing is how many of us don't ask God for wisdom. You make decisions all the time and you don't turn to the Lord and ask for wisdom. You don't, you don't actually pray a prayer that says, hey Lord, I need your help and your direction. You're the God that's overall. You see the future. You know the decision I'm going to make and you know how the, how the future is going to be around that decision. So Lord, I want you to give me wisdom so that I can do things that please and honor you ultimately. And we pray and we ask for wisdom from God. And again, it's like, like I talked about in week two, that, that prayer needs to be our first response and not our last resort. But, but for many people, that's not the first place you go when you're facing this decision. You'll go to a, some book or you'll go to some statistical data that the earth has to offer. You'll, you'll go to something in this world and you won't seem to go after something from the world beyond it, from the God of the universe. And he says, you ask. There's another scripture that, that says, we have not because we ask not. And I wonder if wisdom and godly decisions is one of those areas. We have not because we don't ask God. So I want to encourage you when you're facing uh, the, the decisions in life and you maybe feel that anxiety and that tension coming, ask God for wisdom. The second thing this morning, seek advice from mature brothers and sisters in Christ. Seek advice from mature brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me, let me illustrate this for you, make sure that we understand exactly what I'm saying. I'm talking about mature brothers and sisters, mature believers in Jesus Christ, not your best friend Ned. You're like, oh, man, you don't know, though. Ned, Ned loves me, my family. I've known Ned for 30 years, and Ned never do anything to hurt my family, and so I'm going to lean on Ned's wisdom. It's like, is Ned a believer? No. Ned never gone to church a day in his life, but oh, he's a good old boy. He, oh man, you know, he's a cuss, but oh, he, he, he would never do anything to hurt me, so I listened to Ned. It's like, really? I want people who are focused on eternal life and on God. Remember last week we talked about that our citizenship is not in this world. And so we need to be seeking counsel not from this world, but we need to be seeking counsel from people that are focused on God Almighty and focused on eternal things because they're more than likely going to steer us the right direction. Now, if you had, I'm not saying we're going to bat a thousand here, but if you had a brother or sister in Christ that could help you make decisions in life, that you could bring those whoppers to them and they could advise you, they would pray with you, they may even send, you know, go through scriptures with you, they may even text you scripture. I was reading the scripture and I thought of you because you shared your circumstance with me. Here's where I've feel like God's speaking to me, and I'm going to share that with you now. If you could get that 90% right on your decisions, that they would help you make decisions right to honor God 90% of the time, how many of you would sign up for those odds? I would. In a heartbeat, 90%. How many you sign up for 75%? Three out of four, that you'd make the right best choice. I mean, I'm like, yeah. I, I would go for that every day of the week. You know, it's not that we're perfect. It's not that even that we can discern perfectly. But I bet if you played the odds out, the odds are more in the favor of someone who is following Christ, of someone who is maturing in their belief of him, of somebody that's a Bible thumper, of someone that's studying the word of God and praying to God and has that relationship with God, that that person is going to make a wiser decision than a person that has no relationship with God at all. Like I said, maybe not 100% of the time, but I bet you many of the times. Because they're asking God for wisdom. The first thing. And they're seeking out the ways of God. Proverbs eleven fourteen says this. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. You see, before we make these life-changing decisions, we need to seek the wise counsel of the brothers and sisters in Christ that God has put around us. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. 
I've had several people through the years I've had the uh, privilege of offering godly uh, wisdom and counsel them, praying with them through decisions. And it's amazing to me how many of them, uh, when push comes to shove, they will go chasing after something in the world and leave the wisdom of Scripture, leave the wisdom of God behind and what some of those end results are. Now, I remember I had a family here that I was actually uh, close to many years ago. And, uh, you know, we, we were... They were, they were making a, a, a tough decision. They, they could move to another town and still be in Oklahoma, but be a ways away from Enid. Uh, they could move to another town and, and, and make about 10000 more per year. My question was, because of some of the stuff we'd been through and some of the stuff I knew what was going on in their life, their marriage, some of their past, uh, some of those temptations that the devil was still wanting to bring before them, is this the best decision for your family? I remember sitting down with the husband. You know, because in my heart, I was like, I just don't think it's worth $10,000 to run the risk. Well, I mean, we're, we're kind of in rehabilitation for your family mode right now. You said your marriage is better than it's ever been. Your kids are better than they've ever been. It's, is it worth money to make this decision to move and to go? And to me, everything in me just said, no, don't do it. I didn't demand. I didn't give him an edict. I just gave him. This is where I feel like I'm just not sure this is the best choice for your life. But he made the choice. And within five years, he was divorced. Now, I'm not saying every time this scenario happens that, you know, but there was just something in me that says this is going to make the struggle go up more. This is going to make it even harder than it was before when you were here with us. And so I want to give you what I feel like the Lord's impressing on me, brother to brother, is really reconsider this decision. That's why you need godly counsel in your life. That's why you need some people you can bounce some ideas off of. It's amazing how some people will do that and they'll have Two, three, four, five people in God's church, brothers and sisters that know their situation, that care about them, all tell them the same thing. Like, you think the Lord might be leading you in this direction? <laughs> I know so many times we want it to be like it was in the Old Testament, that God would just write it on the wall, right? But it's not that way, but he does give us each other. And I think if you find, again, mature brothers and sisters in Christ, Seek their counsel before you make those major decisions in life. And I think, once again, God can use that to have that anxiety about those choices go down. He can actually bring them under the lordship and control of, of Christ Jesus. So we're going to ask God for wisdom. We're going to seek advice from mature brothers and sisters in Christ. And the last one this morning, whatever you decide, do it for the glory of God. Whatever you decide, do it for the glory of God. Whatever the decision is. Well, what if I chose this or whatever it is, do it for the glory of God. Psalm chapter 37 verse 5 says this. Commit your way, the way you're going in that decision, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. Do you actually mean that, God? Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, which seems so trivial, but whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You see, so many people, they want to know God's will. Right? That's the question of the decision. That may be what's making the, the, the question and the decision more stressful and bringing on more anxiousness to us. Is what, Well, I don't want to make the wrong decision if God says go right and I go left. What's going to happen to me? I mean, I don't want to make the wrong choice here. It's, it's, I, I, you know, I, I want to know the will of God. Let me tell you what the will of God is, is I know it after reading Scripture for so many years. God's will is you be in relationship with Him and that you bring Him glory. You know, so many people get caught up in thinking God's will is this one straight line. And, and man, if you get it wrong, if you make the wrong choice, if you guess wrong and you get off that one way path. You know, people do this in relationships a lot. It's like, who am I supposed to marry? I really like, you know, these three people. What if God's will is you can marry any of the three your heart desires, but you bring glory to me in that marriage? In other words, for men, I will love whichever one I choose as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
And then that, that wife, that maybe you've got three or four guys that are courting you right now, and you're going to make that decision that whichever one you choose, you're going to love him and you're going to respect him and you're going to show him honor through respect. You're going to be, you're going to be his biggest cheerleader. You're going to be backing him. You're going to undergird him with prayer. You're going to be a supportive wife. You're going to show them respect. The scripture says that we need to love and honor and respect our husbands. And that's God's will. We get caught up in, well, it was about the decision of which one, because if my picker's broken. No. I find that most marriages, most women will stay with a guy that loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. They, they, they're, they're not getting divorced at a high rate. <laughs> Same thing with a, a woman, uh, with, with a woman that, that respects her husband and shows him that honor and, and supports him and believes in him. So many of our men today, ladies, just want, just want you to believe in them. You support them and you love them and you respect them and you believe in them. And I don't know many guys will be running away from a lady that does that. See, God's will for you is that you bring him glory in whatever that decision is. And I agree, sometimes you can bring him greater glory in this way than you could in this way. But whatever you choose, and even if you get down the road from a decision, you're like, oh, that wasn't the best choice. That wasn't my first best right choice. I wish I'd have done this. After you've already gone down that path, do it all for the glory of God. Bring God into it. Maybe, maybe it's a work decision. Well, like, man, I wish I'd never left that company. My relationships were so much better. And, and I was going to you know, move up faster, and now I get over here, and I realize that's okay. Whatever God's got you in right now, we're going to use that. We're going to do everything we can here to bring glory to God. Maybe there's someone that's lost there that you're going to bring glory to God, and you're going to help them find their way back to God. They're, you're going to help them find their way home and get saved. But whatever it is, whatever circumstance in life, whatever decision that you're making, whatever you're facing, you're going to do it for the glory of God. You ask him for wisdom, you seek advice from mature brothers and sisters in Christ, and whatever you decide, do it for the glory of God. And if you think that's it, well, if I just do those three things, then I won't be anxious. No, 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 no. Don't miss what the Apostle Paul said, and I'm going to end the sermon series here, right back where we started. Right, right back here in Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Because there's a key to this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. For emphasis sake, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. For the Lord, he's near. Do not be anxious, Christ child, about anything. But in every situation, through prayer and through petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all human understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. How, Paul? How is it all possible? In Christ Jesus. We can get caught up in the patterns of behavior and the ways that we need to change, but you need to understand, he gave you the ultimate answer to the elimination of anxiety, worry, stress, and depression in your life. It's in Christ Jesus. He will guard your hearts and your minds. How? In Christ Jesus. What do you mean, Paul? I mean, you surrender to Christ Jesus. You go on to verses 8 and 9, and whatever is noble, whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. And when you do that, guess what? It's the peace of God that will be with you. And verse 7 said that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And some of you this morning that are really struggling with you and you felt like throughout this series, yes, this has been for me. Guess what? That's what's missing right now is in Christ Jesus. You're not close to Jesus right now. Some of you don't have a relationship with him. The most talking to him you do is Sunday morning with the prayers and service. That's not a relationship with God. For some of you, you just need to understand Christ Jesus is there and he loves you. He will forgive all of your sins if you ask him to. He will give you newness of life. He will guide and guard your heart and your mind through the power 
Understand that he died for you, but he also he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And it's in that same power that Christ rose from the dead that we too can walk in newness of life and have hope of overcoming anything in this world. But it's only in Christ Jesus. For some of you, you've never called upon his name. You've never, you've never made that decision to give your life fully to Christ Jesus, to put your faith in him. So maybe this morning is the time. There's many more of you that, yes, okay, yes, I'm a Christ child and stuff, and I may, I may, I'm even feeling a little bit of shame this morning because I'm still anxious about lots of things, and yet I have Christ Jesus. But are you allowing him to speak into your life? Because he does it, he does it through the Bible. He does it through the Word. Are you praying to Him? Anxious for nothing through prayer and petition? Petition has repetition in the idea of it. This isn't just a one-time thing. This is, I'm going I'm to have a relationship with God where we talk. And He knows my heart. And we're going to talk more than one time a day. And we're going to talk more than before lunch and before bedtime. We're going to talk during the day. So I always tell people, you pull up to me in an intersection, you see in my car... I'm talking to God, okay? I'm like, if you're like, you're talking to yourself? No, I've gotten that text before. You're talking to yourself? What are you, who are you talking to? He's talking to God. He's with you. He wants to be with you. He wants to be in a relationship with you every step of the way in every decision in life that you have to make, every circumstance that would come up. There's nothing that he can't overcome. He overcame death. He can overcome anything that comes up in your life. But you've got to have this mindset. It's going to be me and Jesus. Me and Jesus. And Jesus. It is in Christ Jesus that you don't have to be anxious for anything. Let's pray. Lord God, I know that for many of us, this is really real because it hits home. Because if we're honest, we do worry and we have stress and we do feel anxious from time to time. But in Christ Jesus, Lord, I believe we can be delivered from that. That's what the Apostle Paul is screaming to us through verse 6 about. Do not be anxious about anything. It's because he had experienced it himself. He had experienced the truth. He had gone through what all the things that he had gone through in life. And he had seen your mighty hand at work. He had seen your will be done in his life. And even though, Lord, it says that when he first came to you, he was blinded possibly had eye problems for the rest of his life, he would always lean and depend on you. Lord God, I just pray this morning as we uh, sing this song of invitation, as we come to this time in our service where we can respond. Lord, if anyone is outside of you or anyone needs to repent and, and make a turn around in their life and come back to you, God, I pray they would make that choice to walk over to the decision room, that that would be their next best decision is to walk and to talk to one of our guides, one of our elders, one of our staff about their relationship with you because, Lord, we know all these things we've been talking about are only possible in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for his love and his grace and his mercy. And ask God to continue to do that work in our minds and our hearts right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.